Good morning. My name is Nathaniel Osgood. It's a great honor, pleasure, and privilege to be with you today to very briefly characterize some of the exciting work that we're doing with the Saskatoon Police Policing Analytics Lab. In particular, our work related to uh, suicide and opioids. This topic has a rather broad scope, and I'm going to have to go very, very quickly given the, um, the limited time. But in the talk, I'm hoping to set a bit of context um, to understand why in, in both these very important areas. Um, we need to uh, make use of computational informatics tools to more judiciously make uh, effective policy. And we're going to be talking about the particular um, uh, emphases uh, that our workplaces within the suicide prevention and opioids areas, recognizing that this work is um, uh, in progress. Um, underway, uh, but much of it still lies in the in the future in terms of, of its details of how exactly it will play out in light of the learning involved. We'll then be talking about um, uh, taking a step back and reflecting on the perspective of what modeling process brings to the table, using models not as a crystal ball but as a learning tool in some conclusions. Many of those in the audience are familiar with the, uh, the gnarly, tangled nature of the opioid crisis. Um, but I want to draw the attention of the audience to the fact that uh, opioids is, is one of these issues that's not merely complicated with lots of moving parts, but is in a technical sense complex, a situation where um, we're deal grappling with a situation where the system as a whole um, is, is far different than merely the sum of its parts. It's, it's got uh, lots of moving parts, not only in one area, but uh, across many areas, um, not just uh, justice policing, but against uh, social, across social services, of course, and, and health. Um, but what makes it really particularly difficult to deal with is also the fact that it's, it's, it's complex, that we're dealing with a situation where um, we can understand a lot about the pieces, but, but unless we understand about the relationships between them, these cross-sectoral components, we won't really understand um, how to formulate effective policy. We have very complex dynamics in terms of tolerance dynamics, in terms of different entry routes um, uh, associated with the social embedding um, of opioids, and the fact that social disruption is both a contributor and a cause, these aspects of reciprocal causality. And what this leaves us with is, is great difficulty in, in deciding where to effect, most effectively invest resources to undertake actions. The fact that an investment over here in, um, in enhanced uh, prescription, um, uh, prescription monitoring or um, uh, changing our prescription policy of when we prescribe opioids for chronic pain ends up impacting um, the, the need for police to intervene in the case of of uh, opioid overdoses, um, in turn affects the burden of, of opioid uh, overdoses and other opioid-related complaints within emergency rooms. Um, uh, changes in the form of, of, of moving towards a recovery-oriented system of care has, has impacts in terms of, of corrections. And when we're dealing with this sort of situation of these pervasive links and, and what policy choices where the impact of two policies can be very different than each of those, the sum of each of the impacts in isolation, where they can be synergistic or in, in tension. The challenge of where to invest most effectively is, is particularly pronounced. And I would note that, that in, the, in the suicide prevention area, we're dealing with similar, similar quandaries, similar cross-sectoral nature, um, similar reciprocal effects, uh, social disruption is a contributor and is an effect. Uh, once again, the social embedding of suicides uh, and the very real interaction between um, uh, the, uh, the institutional nature of corrections and the risks of suicides um, within them, uh, the interaction with, with substance use and mental health issues. And once again, we're dealing with a real quandary in figuring out where to invest most effectively. Is it in areas that, that observers have fingered as an aspect of, of universal prevention Broader, uh, broader things such as effective public health messaging and school-based interventions, positive youth development, 
Is it selected interventions that focus on particular at-risk groups or indicated interventions to individuals with a history of self-harm or who have, um, have undertaken suicide attempts, community uh, caseworkers for, uh, for effectively uh, working with individuals' mental health issues out in, uh, in society or more effective use of novel venues. Where do we invest most effectively is a real quandary because investments in any in multiple parts of the system may again have synergistic effects or even work across purposes. We're dealing here, in short, with, with complex systems, uh, sy systems where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, systems which are nonlinear, where we have multiple investments that yield effects very different than, than the sum of each. And these systems react very surprisingly and often pervasively to interventions so that when we think we've nipped something in the bud by intervening in one place, it pops out somewhere else. Really, we're dealing here with uh, something where the, the metaphor of the blind man and the elephant is all too appropriate. We're used to, to dealing with blinders about particular components of the elephant, dealing in a siloed world with data and policy and the, and the justice and the social services or in the health area. But we need to deal, if we want to capture this elephant and stop its rampage, we need to deal with the whole elephant. For this issue, um, within the predictive analytic space, we're, we turn to system science or complexity science, the science of the whole. And the foremost tool of that is in, is in the form of dynamic models. These are simulation models that capture, in an operational way, uh, hypothesized uh, factors relating to how we think the world uh, operates in terms of how different pieces are linked to each other, prescribing policies. Uh, related to opioid dependence and opioid dependence associated with, um, with changes in prescribing that may leave an individual exposed to desire to, to seek out dealers, the ways in which dealers interact with, with individuals. Models capture these hypotheses for the world and they help us falsify them more, more quickly because they provide a way to examine the, the system-wide consequences um, uh, of, of, of this, uh, this uh, hypothesis and lets us check the degree, assess, evaluate the degree to which it's consistent with the evidence. They also allow us to ask what if questions. If we've developed a certain confidence in the what if questions, if we intervene in a certain place, what are its impacts throughout the system? Uh, these, these sort of models can help us better understand um, to what degree our thinking about the world is, is consistent with evidence so we can learn when we have mistakes in our thinking and can help us understand which sort of interventions will have greatest effects. Often the models are, are very visual, have a strong geographic component, um, both to their, to their presentations and to how they're phrased. And they can be used at various levels, from case level up to the strategic. These models provide a really formidable tool in helping to learn more quickly from complex, um, complex systems by serving as what-if tools to identify um, desirable policies, um, anticipating emerging challenges months before we would have perhaps noticed them from, from uh, uh, particular lines of empirical data. Um, the model provides a sort of central place to integrate data from many, many different data sources and can point us to certain data sources that are, where the need is particularly keen to inform our understanding. And they provide a central place where we can make, make use of and make sense of the diversity of constantly updating evidence. In, a, in the, the, world, the emerging world of big data, they provide a way of capturing and understanding the world that's, that's on an ongoing basis regrounded in emerging evidence and um, where we keep the model current with the latest evidence and where in some sense it, it learns from incoming data. So I'd like now to very briefly talk about how this applies to each of these areas. Within the suicide prevention area, we've noticed it, 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 it has this sort of gnarly character of a, of a complex system. Um, we have multiple lines of evidence to try to address this from identification of, of risk factors that are most predictive of self-harm, suicidal ideation, and behavior, and, and identification of high-risk individuals, 
um, to, to understanding particular aspects of, of microbehavior, to understand the effects of particular intervention strategies, understanding how uh, particular interventions, say, related to, to suicide actually uh, impact uh, people's behavior and the degree to which it lowers their, their risk of, of self-harm. These models provide us a way of asking what-if questions that can help identify interventions that would provide the greatest positive impact in terms of reducing self-harm, suicidal ideation, suicidal behavior. Um, and at the same time, they provide us with this way of sort of getting an x-ray of, of the system when we, that can link so many lines of evidence, but also point to areas of the system that aren't directly observed, what's likely going on there for the system as a whole to behave in the way that, that we see. Our partners for this work are, include Public Health Agency of Canada, an arm of the federal government, Sachs Institute, Winston Sydney University, and, and other Australian partners, and as, as examples of Australian partners, uh, the city of Lalage, and Northern Medical Services, and a very exciting work on, we're, we're excited to be finalizing uh, some plans for work with social services and justice ministries within Saskatchewan and uh, with some preliminary uh, work uh, with the Saskatoon Police Service in terms of understanding what's in their database and we're anticipating uh, firming up uh, that relationship in coming months. The methodologies we use here make use of these techniques known as machine learning, hidden Markov models, uh, Bayesian graphical modeling, and combination of these dynamic models we've seen with some very powerful techniques known as particle filtering and particle MCMC that allow us to, to really estimate what's going on there, even in areas of the system that are not directly observed, taking advantage of our knowledge of how the system links, um, one part of the system links to one another. We also have, a uh, have techniques that help us assess the causal drivers for the situation, how one component is linking to another. This is an example of, of a model that I helped offer some advice for in the Australian context, and we have work going on um, in adapting some of these, uh, these models in creation of new models here within Canada that capture the unique features of the Canadian context. There's a variety of sources of evidence that, we, uh, that we're drawing on in this work, including um, a great deal of evidence. We're very excited to, to have being brought from the table from Ministry of Social Services, longitudinal data on individuals for youth of, under care, but also data for the general population, um, as well as, in, in some cases, for sentinel cons um, consenting populations using smartphones that can pick up data on changes in contact patterns and socialization patterns um, that can be indicative of depression and similarly changes in sedentary behavior and, and physical activity um, and mobility patterns. Um, we've also been um, uh, experimenting with apps that, that help uh, provide effective social support for individuals, sharing uh, concerns among concerned parties pooling information around an individual at risk, um, suicidal ideation, and reaching out to that individual in a reliable way and, and knowing um, the likely status of that individual. I don't have time to emphasize all the detailed benefits, but suffice it to say we see this work as informing and helping those um, who run group homes, um, those in corrections area and, and social workers law enforcement and, and those in the Ministry of Social Services, uh, Justice, in, in, in the policing area. Within the opioids area, um, we're undertaking uh, also a number of lines of work. Um, uh, as in, as in um, suicide, we're dealing with big uncertainties here, big uncertainties on just what's going on in the world, how many individuals out there securing prescriptions, maybe confabulating, for example. Um, uh, what's going on in terms of uh, street availability of, of uh, some of the fentanyl that's hinted at by, by police intelligence, but um, may not be obvious. There's large areas of this diverse multi-sectoral system inside of corrections, on the street, and the health system that pose big question marks. And much of our work is, is aimed at filling those in. Um, 
we use models to, to really think through how these different pieces of the system relate to one another so we can, we can catch misunderstandings more quickly advance our, our knowledge. Um, and we're using models and big data to understand the detailed effects of particular interventions uh, aim to reduce the, the burden of opioid abuse. For example, with our work with, uh, with highly trained service dogs for veterans with PTSD. And I, I want to emphasize that a key need um, uh, in light of the uncertainty um, involved in the opioid epidemics is the emphasis on leveraging big data um, leveraging models to help us learn more quickly from a very rapidly evolving situation and new evidence that comes to bear. So some of this work, as I've noted, is, is very detailed. It focuses on particular interventions, such as this, this uh, pairing of a highly trained service dog with opioid-dependent veterans, where we can use wearable technologies and phones to, to really track how much time is that veteran spending with the dog. And when they do spend time with the dog, to what degree does it affect flashback occurrences? self-reported by the vet, but also picked up in terms of sleep quality and the distance of the dog to the vet as related to intervention of the dog. To what degree does it affect their self-reported outlook and affect of the veteran? Or their social contact and isolation as measured through, um, um, through uh, Bluetooth beacons and, and GPS. Physical activity of the individual and sedentary behavior and, and self-reported substance use. Many of our models, we have uh, quite articulated uh, behavior related to uh, dynamics here associated with opioids. For example, um, readiness to change here on the right, um, uh, dynamics associated with uh, current user versus others, and their use of prescription or, or street drugs, for example. And an individual's contact with the healthcare system, which may provide a conduit towards treatment. Um, uh, but also a conduit in some cases adversely towards uh, prescription um, uh, that's, that's based on confabulated uh, chronic pain, say, um, and perhaps uh, harm reduction techniques in the form of prescription um, opioids for, for managing uh, addictions, and even contact with corrections. In other cases, we have models that really depict the evolution of the broader system so we can estimate different states of the system. They depict the system is divided up into these different boxes and individuals is flowing between the boxes as they develop uh, disorders, as they undergo treatment, as they are placed on uh, prescriptions for chronic pain but, but develop uh, disorders for them as chronic pain is managed in other ways. And these sort of models can help us estimate what groups of the population are out there in those different states and at different levels of tolerance, say. We're drawing on a wide variety of types of evidence, lines of evidence in this area from multiple partners. Some of these we have in hand like now, right now, such as uh, data from, from big data, um, Google searches, for example, Twitter data related to attitudes um, on, the, on the opioid front. Um, sometimes positive attitudes in terms of use of opioids, um, illegally even, um, expressed in, in this public uh, discourse. We're hoping to, to bring on uh, police surveillance data that can fill in those components of it, but already from our Ministry of Health, Ministry of Social Services, uh, partners and others, we're anticipating um, some very rich data sources that can, that can help ground our models. Now I want to emphasize here that much of my discussion has, has emphasized these, these technical models that bring much um, insight to the table. These models that, that, that help us reason consistently about the system, help us spot inconsistencies in our thinking more quickly and learn more rapidly from a very rapidly changing situation, learn more robustly. But really, this presentation is, is not about those models. It's not about models as, as, as crystal balls. It's really it's about models as, as learning prostheses, tools that help us learn more quickly from evidence, learn more quickly from observations, so we can realize where our understanding of the system out there just doesn't add up with the evidence more quickly to refine our understanding, to develop a better understanding of what's going on so we can have, be more confident in our decisions about where to intervest. 
And I would note that these benefits, this need for rapid learning, are particularly keen where in areas such as our opioid crisis, where there's big uncertainties, a very rapidly evolving situation, multiple lines of evidence, and very important choices to be made. Here, we're refining our understanding of the world as we observe, we're refining our models, um, capturing our understanding, and we're using them to test our understanding in the form of interventions and learning from those interventions. So a few take-home messages. Predictive analytics can capture collective hypotheses about what's going on in the world and can really aid the speed, depth, and, and reliability of learning from evidence. And this offers particular value when we're uncertain about the world. Good models are, are built by teams and can help us make more effective judicious decisions. Models can leverage the data science revolution um, to help us leverage these multiple lines of evidence. And many problems can benefit strongly from, from this sort of learning, this evidence synthesis, synthesis and the what-if tools that models provide. Thank you very much. It's been my great privilege to be here, and I'd be glad to answer a few questions.